Hi, welcome to the Pottery Shop. We have a surprise for you today. James Wattrell is our guest potter, and he's throwing at the wheel already. And I'd like you to meet James. He's a wonderful man. He's been my teacher, as well as many other people's, and he has a wonderful background in ceramics. To begin with, I'd just like you to watch James do some throwing. He's going to throw a very large piece for us. And I'm going to turn it over to James now at this point. Thank you. What I'm going to do is start throwing a large bowl form. And I've already started to center the, we uh, the clay on the wheel. And I might mention that centering a large ball of clay is a little bit different than working with smaller amounts. And one thing to do maybe is to start using uh, actually part of your body and realizing it's going to take a little longer to center. I like to use this part of my hand, press, but with my whole body against it, keep the wheel going at a brisk speed and realize that because you have so much clay uh, moving in its uh, circumference, it's going to take just a little bit longer to center. Also, I'm running my thumb up the back side of the clay. And it's very important that you get the clay on center and under control. Otherwise, maybe it might be off just a little bit. But by the time you start stretching the clay out, you're going to have some trouble. I'm taking a little bit off that I really don't need. Next thing, opening the clay. Go all the way down. Remember to leave a little extra clay at the bottom. Now, what I'm going to do is start pulling the clay open toward me. I'm using fingers over fingers pressure, taking my time. First of all, realizing you're stretching a large amount of clay out. So it's going to take a little longer. Also, to realize that we're going to have a wide base in the middle of the bowl. And to constantly go back and forth to take the tension out of the center of that clay. Because when you stretch clay that far and that fast, what happens is that the compression is lost. The clay molecules are not lined up. If this is not compensated for, you get the very, uh, a crack in the middle of the bowl, either during the drying or during the bisque firing. You can go back and forth about 10 times, or you can use a small wooden dowel and beat the clay down in the center. Now, what I'm going to do is open this a little more and work with the center. I don't want a hard edge on the inside ball right along here. It'll be a little bit curved because this is going to be a bowl. There are many, many approaches to throwing a bowl and opening. This one I'm going to work with the cylinder form and then form it out a little bit. And again, remember to take your time because this is a lot of clay. Also, that the clay itself, whether it's hard or soft, is going to determine what happens. Some potters like to work with very stiff clay. Some clay is, some work with softer clay. That's going to determine your form, what you can do. Now, I'm going to just get this ready to bring it up a little bit. I want to weight the inside a little bit, too. I'm going to use pressure from the outside and the inside and come on up. I'm going to collar this back in a little bit. It's spreading out a little bit on me. Different clays have different characteristics. You just have, sort of have to learn them. It's like learning about people a little bit, what it will do and what it won't do for you. Also. Now we're going to take a little more pressure and bring the clay up, up, up. Take your time and concentrate. Now one of the things when I'm working, I'm really not watching my hands that much, but I'm watching the contour of the form itself, the shape out here. That will tell my hands what I need to do. Every so often putting fresh water on this, uh, on the clay to keep it well lubricated. Again, pressure. One of the things is when you go to the wheel, know what you're going to throw. I've always told myself that, my students, and not to sort of let things happen. Again, the pressure from the inside and out is consistent to bring the clay up and keep bringing it up. Even though this is going to be a bowl form, it's starting out as a cylinder. 
And that's sort of the basic shape in throwing that students learn to get control and to get height with the clay. Again, question? Concentrate, concentrate. Remember that the clay is moving between your fingers. And the pressure should be consistent. What's happening is that you're squeezing. Clay is moving between your fingers, and it's going 360 degrees around. It's like making a gesture. It's like dancing almost. You make a gesture, it goes all the way around. In this case, it takes a little longer to get around. And to take your time, I keep stressing time simply because when you're working smaller, you're used to getting to a certain time frame for making a piece. But when you go larger, one of the hardest things to do is to learn to slow down a little bit. Again, I'm going to bring up some more clay, but I'm going to start taking this clay, and I'm going to start pressing it out just a little bit from the inside. I'm using pressure from the inside, but still also pressure from the outside because I want the clay to climb, but at the same time, I want to get a little bit of form. All the way to the top, concentrate. At this point, I'm going to start cutting back on the water, because I don't need too much water on it. And this clay is soft, soft by nature, and I don't want to get too much water in the clay or it can start becoming wet and saggy. But again, concentrate. Take your time. If you start moving too fast, you'll distort the clay, and the form will uh, start shaking. The thing is, think up. Keep the clay coming up. Keep it between your fingers. Keep the pressure consistent. Clay only does what you want it to do. The point is to find out what it will do. I want to bring a little more clay up, and then I'm going to start forming the piece and uh, with, the rib, with the metal ribs and try to get it closer to what I have in mind. There's something about bowls. I really do like to throw bowls a lot because when I open the bowl, I kind of open myself, and one of my practices in throwing, especially if I'm going to throw large, I'll throw a series of small bowls. And it's kind of like a warm-up for a piano. I mean, throwing is like piano work. One must keep after it. And uh, concentration. But it's very rewarding to actualize clay into a form that's yours. At this point, I'm going to start using the metal rib. And I use it for forming and shaping. And uh, the metal rib, I'm going to use the straight side here because uh, I find the metal rib instead of rubber or wood, for me at this point, more flexible. I'm going to use the edge here. Now, I don't really put the rib right against the clay. It is held slightly away from the clay, say maybe about a quarter of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch, and I press from the inside so that the form goes against the shape that I want. I think you'll see the bowl change in a minute here. Also, part of it, too, because I take the throwing lines out because I like to work with surface and I need a smooth surface. Okay. I have to stop for a minute and remove some of the slip. Okay. I'm going to, where I stopped at this point, right here, sort of jump above it a little bit and press in. That's going to leave a ridge, a nice line for me which is sort of a division line between the two parts of the form. And again, you work this, actually it's like working with a lathe uh, and wood, slowly but surely. Now you have to concentrate. I've gotten this off a little bit, so I have to work to get it back on center. Oh, it's starting to come now. I'm going to hold the rib slightly against the form and press from the inside. And again, I have to remember to be, take my time with it. 
to slowly but surely sort of coax it into uh, its final state. Because I really believe in form and details. I think de de the uh, details are very much the main aspect of any ceramic form. Because there's probably no form that you'll make on the wheel that hasn't been made five million times before you. But you know, all of a sudden, why is one person's, two or three people working with the same form, one form is more memorable than the other? And I think that has a lot to do with details. OK. I'm going to need to use a sponge on this to soften this line here. I'm working this a little bit. It's gotten off a little bit, but I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah. Again, I'm going to work this detail here. I use this part as sort of a division between two, two parts of the form, which for decorative purposes, and I like it, I think having the round form and then the straight side. Now, what I'm going to do, first of all, is take off some of the clay at the bottom here. I don't need all of this. Usually I'll leave extra clay simply because it gives me more clay to trim underneath to really get the form nice and round. Um, I can also refinish the form a little bit. I cut underneath the wooden tool. Is, this is a wonderful tool of cutting it at, an, at a slight angle and tuning down to pull this clay away from the form so that when I do use a wire or a needle to cut that clay, it'll come off a lot easier. There we are. Okay. Now I'm going to go back in and go back down there a little bit, get the form work. One has to concentrate. There we are. I'm going a little slow because the clay is wet, and I don't want to push it too fast at this point. I'm just about done with this bowl at this point. And I'll have to let the bowl set up till it's leather hard before I can turn it over and trim the bottom, which is another process I really like to do. I think trimming is very important. Now, what I'm going to work on a little bit is the division line here, this edge, which, uh, again, has to be just so, so that it looks intentional and uh, it functions well with the form. I'm using the flat part of the rib here to give me a little bit of definition and underneath also. Oh, that's really nice. James, we're going to have to go for a break now. Okay. And we thank you. It's been fun watching this part. And James will be with us when you come back, so don't go away.
Welcome back to the Pottery Shop. I'm Martha Doggett, and today we have our guest, James Wattrell. He just finished throwing a very large bow for us, and now he's going to tell us a little bit about the bow after it's been completed. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about James before we get into that. He really has impeccable credentials. He grew up in Cleveland, studied at the Cleveland Art Institute, isn't that right? Right. With his MFA from Tulane University. He currently has his uh, studio downtown in Dallas, and he also teaches at the Craft Guild of Dallas. Do you teach other places as well right now? Uh, no, not at the moment, mostly at the Crafts Guild right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. I do lecture from time to time and uh, maybe guest teach at certain other institutions. Okay. Mm -hmm. James currently has three shows on throughout the United States as well. One is in Michigan. Tell us, in Michigan, where? Uh, at the Atrium Gallery in Indianapolis. Uh, I also have one show in New Orleans at the Mario Villa Gallery. And there's a show opening uh, on the 21st at the uh, Eastfield College, which is a group show from the uh, ceramic instructors at the Craft Guild of Dallas. That's so that runs till uh, April 30th. Well, there's still time for us to see that. Uh, would you tell us, James, about this bowl? This is similar to the bowl that you were throwing on the wheel during mm -hmm. the first portion of the show. Mm -hmm. What kind of um, glaze did you use? This is a uh, high fire stoneware glaze. And these glazes are, uh, this is gas fired in the kiln at about 2300 degrees Fahrenheit and a reduction firing which is a little different than electric firing in that. And these glazes are formulated and made uh, according to recipe, they're not commercial glazes. Now the top glaze here is a um, saturated iron glaze which means it has a high content of iron which gives it a very particular type of um, a surface and character you can't get any other way. This uh, glaze is a spodumin glaze, which spodumin is the main ingredient, and it produces a very beautiful uh, kind of rich earth tone color. Now, where you have the lighter colors here, the glaze overlaps, it's thicker. Sometimes the glaze will give you uh, several different colors depending on how, how uh, thick or thin that you have it. And this is the line that you were discussing? Yes, on? I was discussing the line. I like making the division here, and uh, sometimes, in working with the glazes, the uh, top part design from the bottom will be very distinct. In this case, I let the glazes overlap because I do like that softness. But sometimes the lines will be very, very precise and very clear. So uh, this is one of the bowls and the trimmed at the bottom. And I do like making these. These are nice and full. Now this glaze here at the top, um, in reduction, you'll get different effects than you will in an electric kiln. This is really lovely. I really, and you, I don't know, you can see your finger marks on the inside mm -hmm. of the throwing lines. I really like that. A lot of times I'll take the throwing marks out, uh, not on the inside. Mm -hmm. And the throwing mark is a very beautiful part of the ceramic process because it's like the um, uh, fingers, you know, the touch, yes. which is very important. But in this case, um, a lot of my pieces I will on the outside keep it smooth because I like to work with texture and pattern very much. So I need to have sort of a, like a canvas-like surface very smooth in order to work with. Right, you have a background as a painter as well, don't you? I know that you like to paint on surfaces of your pots. I do very much. Well, I'm a frustrated painter. I started out to be a <laughs> painter, and I took ceramics quite by accident, and I don't know what happened. I do now, and I really like ceramics. The idea that uh, the three-dimensionality and the need to mm -hmm. touch, there's something about actualizing a form this way, which was meant more for me, and it was able to... Uh, uh, had a wonderful sense of discipline, and I like the process very much. This Let's religion. show some of the slides that we have right. so that people understand what we're talking about. And we, this is one slide here. Tell us about this one now. Well, this is the uh, Neo Apulian series that I'm working with, number two. This is about uh, 18 inches high by 15 inches wide. Now, Apulian, the word is based on ancient Greek pottery from the uh, late 4th century BC, meaning the characteristic was a very wide lip and a small container in the middle, and very classical form, and handles on each side, which uh, are like the classical uh, pieces. Now, I'm just, I like to work that way naturally. A lot of my work is very formal, but in this case, so, since it related so much to the Apulian, I call it the Neo-Apulian series. And this is low fire. Uh, it has copper leaf in the middle, which uh, uh, gives it a wonderful glow. That's lovely. Thank you. And. Uh, Here's another one from the same series in that. 
Uh, again, these are commercial glazes. Now the handles on top, this one's a little more free. I really like landscape design. I have a secret passion of designing whole gardens and that. And a lot of this, I like to draw also, which is a very strong part of my uh, uh, discipline. I do draw a lot. And a lot of times it's always form, which is a solid shape and line coming off of it. Well, now, speaking of landscape, didn't you apply to the city to Dallas to be an advisor for some of oh, their yeah, landscaping? That, well, that's, that competition is still going on, and we'll have to see what happens oh, okay. on that. Now, this is another vessel from the same series. It's a different shape it's, uh, with the copper leaf. And, and these become more than just vessels. They are kind of an embodiment, a sense of order. That's really why I try to work a lot, uh, is to find order for myself and, and to make my own images in that. There's another one using the Desert series. Uh, this is um, the part, the painted part, very much looks like Egyptian desert, and I like to paint uh, a lot of my background. I do have a lot of my work refers or, uh, to historical design and that, and simply because those were styles that interested me very much, and I'm trying to use them in a way that's meaningful. This is a very large pink and black neo Apulian vessel, <laughs> and it has a nice uh, kind of humor to it. And uh, again, this paint work on this, the brushwork is much more free, painterly, but still there's control. I'm always conscious of my relationship of the small form in the center to the edges and that. And again, this is, uh, all of these pieces are earthenware, low fire, and they're um, uh, fired in electric hill with commercial glazes. Okay. Let's look at some of the pieces that we have brought today. Um, could we see this, this one? This was just very similar to the one that we were showing. Right. But maybe if we just hold it and turn it around. Tell us, how did you do this? This is thrown in one piece. This is thrown upside down on the wheel head. And uh, very much looks like this. When the clay is leather hard, I'll add the foot. The whole form is turned over and then uh, cleaned up and uh, trimmed a little bit. This fired, and then I go into the glazing process. I want really simple. this is absolutely spectacular. I want to get it so that the lights don't glare on it too much. Tell us, you want to hold it or do you want me Doesn't to hold matter. it? Tell us about this. This uh, was a series of large plates of the Indian Sky series. And again, uh, working with uh, clay as almost a painterly surface and canvas. And again, based on American Indian design only in relationship of uh, its composition like A to A, B to B, C, C, this sort of thing. And a lot of the technique is very simple. I use a lot of stencil, scotch tape, um, uh, contact paper, and uh, uh, brushwork, uh, maybe underglazed pencil. In other words, whatever uh, I think is necessary to um, enhance the form. And a lot of it, again, is very formal, very pattern oriented because I do like pattern as a uh, kind of a creative element and a very personal element to the work or where it'll unify a whole surface or a whole form. These look like clouds. Does that have anything yes, to do? Yes, they are. Well, they're, uh, it was the Indian Sky series. And uh, newer plates, I sort of the clouds have disappeared. And, but this one, they're nice and bright and red. And again, I mean, kind of very painterly. And fluid area is based on this, which is very formal and very controlled. So I wanted to have both elements in the same piece. Tell us about these little. OK, those are my mother's pinking shears <laughs> and I uh, use for contact paper, and which I'll put on the piece. All the glazing is done on bisque after it's fired. Contact paper is laid on or scotch tape, glazed over and pulled off before you do the firing so that you have, you can create really a very intricate pattern surface that way. And this was done with commercial glaze, Commercial right? glaze. I know that, uh, I'll throw this at you, 20 seconds left, but uh, there is some controversy. Some potters don't like using commercial glazes. And well, tell I, us your feeling about that, because I think that's very uh, Well, I think it's up to the potter, as long as the pieces work. The whole point right. is they are just glazes. And uh, I think it, uh, on the con there are potters who are very committed to the traditional process of you know, total control over their glazes. Right. And there are others that, you know, it's like those are just material to get to that uh, concept or idea you have. I like commercial glazes. They work very well. My discipline for years have been in high fire and traditional. But I think it's up to the potter if the pieces work. Right. If, if the piece does what it's supposed to do and its uh, intention is realized, then these would work out very well. Oh, great. We've got to go for our final break. Don't lo run away now because we'll be back.
This is a pottery shop. I'm Martha Doggett with our guest today, James Wattrell, who's been so gracious to come and to show us how to throw a very large pot. James, you've done so many things. I know over the years I've seen, and I own two of your very large pieces. They are very important pieces in my home. But you do an awful lot. Not only do you throw large pieces, in, but you do things to their surface. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that I'm very interested in. Do you think perhaps you could come back on another show and just show us how you decorate surfaces? Only? I'd be glad to, sure. Okay. I think that would be a nice uh, uh, point to bring up. Sure, I'd be glad to do that. Okay. Sure. Kind of putting you on the spot right here on TV. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I think because you've done so many things, like you mentioned that you use pinking shears here, you've used mm -hmm. uh, commercial glazes and scotch tape, I mean, right. just all these wonderful things. Well, James will be back, so I hope you will come back, too, and watch The Pottery Shop. I'm Martha Doggett. Thanks for being with us today. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.